Hi folks, I'm Father Joe Grimaldi, and you can call me Joe, and I'd like to welcome you to my podcast. But now, here's our host and friend, Ken Calvert. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's Ken Calvert alongside Father Joe Grimaldi, and we would like to welcome you to the Father Joe Grimaldi Podcast. My good friends, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has signed an executive order that has reopened Star Lincoln's auto dealership. However, each customer is permitted into the showroom by appointment only. Star Lincoln is 100% compliant with every CDC guideline, and we sanitize our facility on a non-stop basis. Simply call 248-354-4900 and make an appointment to meet with one of Star's sales professionals or shop Star Express by going to www www.starlincoln.com. Check out the incredible lineup of Lincoln vehicles, the Navigator, the Corsair, the Nautilus, Aviator, MKZ, and the Continental. You can essentially lease or buy your next Lincoln totally online. Our Star Lincoln service is by appointment only and is open from 8 until 5. Our new Lincoln vehicle showroom is now open by appointment only from 9 until 5. Yes, your sanctuary awaits. Go to starlincoln.com. That's starlincoln.com. Com. Well, uh, here we go. Another day, another dollar. No reason to fret or holler, my grandfather. Is it a dollar or a dollar? Which? Yeah, well, my Canadian accent, eh? We're sort of looking at the coronavirus in the rearview mirror, at least for now. Summer has been delightful. Uh, we've had some just absolutely gorgeous days. And we've had some rainy days. We've had a lot of rainy days in our life over the past few months. I believe we can officially say going back to about the 1st of March, but here we are now into June. And now various and sundry studies, surveys, and other nuggets are starting to come out that talk about what it was like to be quarantined for 90 to 120 days. And one of the things that I noticed that didn't surprise me, and I suspect it didn't surprise you at all, the effects of being quarantined for, let's say, 120 days. They're suggesting that separation and divorce is up by at least 25%. Does that surprise you? Uh, yes and no. I, I mean, uh, that tells you that so many of those marriages were not built on rock. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a really good point. I mean, that's a really... they were built on rock. It's for better or for worse, don't you think? I do, and I do. I suspect that um, maybe they're beginning to really know what each other is like, and uh, they don't like what they see, and they're separating. I, I don't know what the percentage is. I suspect it is happening because there's a lot of uh, mental disturbances occurring at this time. People in depression, people that are having difficulties dealing with little kids that are in the house while they're trying to do their work and because they're working from home. There's so many different variables of the coronavirus. I was talking specifically to the fact that the quarantine and 120 days together as husband and wife, and let's add the kids to boot, I think that when you have that period of, let's say, 8 to 10 hours where you're separated from your spouse, you appreciate coming home more, and you, you enjoy seeing everybody, you sort of re-energize, you know, in the house, and then you have that period of dinner, a little, little education with the kids, you know, maybe helping with the homework, and then a little television, everybody goes off to bed, as we like to say, rinse and repeat. When you are together for 24-7 for 120 days, it's the little things that sort of got to you before with your spouse that have really, really gotten to you now. It's become the one blemish that you just can't stop looking at. Without giving you a percentage, it's interesting to me that the great number of couples who are married live without intimacy so when something like this coronavirus happens I think it exacerbates their relationship what I mean by that is many couples get up in the morning have a bite to eat go off to work come back 
have dinner, turn on the TV, go to bed, get up, have a cup of coffee, and so on. Rinse and there's, repeat. Yeah, but there's no intimacy at all. And so I can understand why something like this, where people are forced to live in the same house and have to function talking with each other and being patient with each other exacerbates the whole situation. And they say, I don't want this anymore. I'm going to really move out. We haven't been living together anyway. We're going to just move out. Now, that sounds weird, yes, but it is happening. And the percentage is a lot more than most people think, that that's the way married life is for many, many, many people. Should it be? No. Intimacy is essential. Mm -hmm. And when I speak about intimacy, it's not necessarily sexual. It's a matter of being there for each other. It's a matter of being able to hold each other. It's a matter of holding hands together, sitting down to watch TV together, being able to interact either jokingly, happily, and so on being able to take a little time and say, let's do something fun today. But instead what happens is most people in the United States, that is their ritual in marriage. They live in the same house, but they may as well be brother and sister. They each have their own schedule. They each get up at a certain time, have a cup of coffee, go to work, come back, watch TV, go to bed, get up and so on. So. I think something like this virus certainly blows that up mm -hmm. to the extreme, and this is why. Now, I don't know what else causes people to leave each other during these days of the virus. That's got to be one of the main reasons, I think. The marriage was not solid to start with. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that, and I liked what you did with your summary of intimacy, uh, because I think that's... Uh, paramount that after 37 years of being married I still consider my wife to be my best friend and the one common bond that we always had was the sense of humor between us and the ability to agree to disagree but not on that much but also when we sit down and watch a series we really we're both deeply engaged in watching that particular television series that we're watching and the only question we have is, do you have enough in your tank to watch one more? <laughs> or do you want to wait till tomorrow? Let's watch one more. So I yeah. I, I mean, uh, yesterday, for example, a beautiful day, just doing things together outdoors. It was just very nice, very refreshing. You're getting fresh air, getting sunshine, cooking outside, having a nice meal, and talking about what we were both doing tomorrow, meaning today. She was working she still goes to work only two days a week, but I had a very early dental appointment. Even those minor events we had some interest in. So I think that's that means that it was built on the correct rock and not loose gravel, if you will. Yeah, and that's what intimacy is all about. It's being able to trust one another, being able to interact with one another with ease. Huh? With ease. It's not a challenge. It's something that you look forward to as opposed to something you have to do. You have to be nice. Well, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You must get the occasional text or a phone call from somebody who may ask that you don't share that conversation or that, that advice that you shared with them, calling up saying, what do I do? I'm starting to crack. I need to get away for a while. I think it's going to be fine, but I just need my space. How do I do that, Father? Can you help me? To which you respond. To which I respond, first of all, usually if that's the case, your partner should be able to understand that and know that, okay? And maybe the two of you together can work something out. Maybe it might help if the two of you get in a car and go somewhere together. If you really need to be alone, I hope that you're partner is okay with that and so I think you want to discuss that if it becomes a serious challenge then I think it's important that you see a professional psychologist 
someone who could give you some advice that they are very familiar with and so on. So I, I think intimacy requires that you know your partner and your partner knows you and that you're comfortable enough with each other that you could say, you know, this time together, I like it, but I'm finding this to be a challenge or that to be a challenge and so on. And I think it requires that the partner understand that and they try to do something about it together rather than leaving the one person on his or her own. I think people, when they're confined, though, they have a real short fuse. Their ability to listen and digest large amounts those amounts get smaller and smaller yeah but i mean i think with the two people that love each other sincerely love each other yeah they not always lovey-dovey no (laughs) i I know that but i'm I'm, the way he throws his jacket on the dining room chair never picks it up yeah he drives me nuts yeah but there's love there see it's like the little kid you know there's always that argument do you a hit or slap or whatever the little kid when he does something wrong little kids know if you're doing it out of love or if you're doing it because you can't stand the situation (laughs) and I think it's the same thing with married couples they know if they're angry with each other out of love (laughs) you know he drives me nuts or she drives me or is it I can't stand him. I'm going to leave. This is it. I thought about it and so on. There's a difference, okay? And I think that we're going to take a certain amount of criticism when there's love involved. It's not unusual. You know, I think about when you were saying that. I'm not sure you can find it, but with with all of the cable channels and streaming availabilities, and of course with YouTube you can find it, but I always thought about the one lesson that you got from that show, and my parents used to love watching it, and I think it probably was in real time, The Honeymooners. Ralph Cramden. <laughs> Ralph Cramden. You know, with his, one of these days, Alice. One of these days. Bang, pow, to the moon. But then at the end of the show, I love you, baby. Yeah, of course. Of That's course. what you're talking about in a in a nutshell, right? That Yeah, exactly. And it's a matter of understanding that there is love even in those harsh words. Huh? Right. Because they're said in such a way that the love part of it does come through. Yeah, and I just always thought that that was the that was the the moral of the story. That was basically the same thing with with his buddy Norton. You know, Norton drove him crazy, but he couldn't exist without Norton. No, they were good friends. They couldn't go to the Moose Lodge without each other. Yeah. Ralphie boy, oh, Ralphie boy there. Hey, Ralphie boy, how we doing? <laughs> what do you want, Norton? Get out of here. Obviously, the show did very well because of that. How many people do you think 50 years ago said, 60 years ago, said, that's us, that's your mother and I? I think, I be, I'm willing to bet you, 99% of the people said that's us. I yeah, I bet I, they said people, that's yeah. it. I think it's been I think it's gotten easier over the years. I think a lot of people did not care to be with each other at all, but for the sake of the kids and for the fear of the religion, never even thought about separation or divorce. I remember in high school that was like they're what? They're divorced. Do you think people miss the boat more often now about how important marriage really is? Yeah, I'm just going to give you a few examples that that I know are upsetting to me, okay, is that very often people don't understand what the true marriage is all about. Take, for example, even where marriages are planned by the parents, they know that if they enter this marriage, they're going to learn to love each other, okay? And, And it's interesting to me that how many of those marriages do last because they did learn to love each other. By the same token, I know, too, that I do a lot of preparation for marriage with young people, and very often, uh, and I'm not saying there's anything malicious on the part of the individuals, but they're looking at the marriage as a wedding. And the only thing they're concerned about is the length of the gown, the color of the gown, the color of the 
pieces on the table, the flowers, the uh, band, who's going to be invited, where are we going, and the church has to have a long aisle so that, you know, the father can walk the bride down with this beautiful dress that's going to be shown and all of this. Wait a minute. You have to take time to look at that other person and say, can I live with that other person for the rest of my life? And if you can honestly answer that, go ahead. But if you can't, there isn't going to be a good marriage. I think that's one of the things we have to keep in mind. So very often the planning to marry forgets about getting to know the other person and then making a true decision after you've done it's hard i'm going to use a funny word due diligence yeah. like buying a car yeah. you know what's good what's bad and yeah. you're still going to accept it yeah. if you know your due diligence if you've done your due diligence fine but suppose you enter into a marriage where the people are responding oh you're not going to do that that's got to be a red flag to you yeah. when the parents say i don't want any part of her that's got to be a red flag to you try to investigate why people say that and then if you find substance in that that's when you say okay maybe i have to reconsider this but you don't go into a marriage because of the length of the church aisle yeah. or because of the gown that was made by uh, all these fancy names dior and so on or because of the color of the flowers that look so beautiful. I saw those on, I want those very exact flowers. Anyway, <laughs> right. so we have to be careful. Final question for you. Have you ever, and I'm wondering what, we've talked about weddings and what you do in terms of the preparation a number of times, but I don't remember you answering this or if I ever asked this question, but I will now. Have you ever looked at a couple after counseling them and said, I can't marry you. This wedding is doomed. You're you're doing. I it. I, I didn't use those words. All right. I, no, but have you ever said after, after counseling or let's just say getting to know the couple, I can't do it because I don't trust that you really love each other. I I did once. Different words. Mm -hmm. The poor guy uh, needed help with drinking. He could not go to bed without being drunk. So he would drink himself to the point where he would go to bed. And so the beautiful bride says to me, oh, you know, that's gonna change. After we're married, that's gonna change. I said, it's not gonna change, it's gonna get worse. Because right now, you wanna be the best you can be for each other. After marriage, you don't have to put on any shows, I said. so." He's going to do it more, and whether he's alcoholic or not, I don't know, but he certainly needs help. And unless you get help, I will not perform the marriage. Sure enough, they didn't get the help. I did not perform the marriage. But years later, and this was a good thing, it was a blessing, it really did, because that was a wake-up call. Eventually, they did get help, and eventually, they were married. I don't know if they're still married now, but eventually things worked out for them. But it was really interesting because that was one time I said, this is not going to work. So it had a happy ending. Well, not Not, not, not with you marrying no, them, but the two did no. get married, you said? Eventually. Yeah, okay. So you know why I got a note saying that it was that that inspired them eventually this was about five or six years later. It was not immediate. Uh -huh. And that inspired him to get the help that he needed, and uh, things seemed to be on the right path. Well, God bless Father Joe Grimaldi. No, not Father Joe. It was the, the hand of God. <laughs> All right. Well, can you, uh, can you talk to your fellow and uh, see what he wrote down for you? All right. Would you manage that for us? What did he write for you today? Well, let me say this, okay? Um... I think we have a lot to pray for these days. Obviously, an end to the plague. So many people think that it's over with, and that part of it scares me. And I think we have to pray for an end to this plague. But we also have to pray for patience 
now that things are opening up, we all want to run to the, I want to run to the, <laughs> to the barber shop because yeah. I can't believe I can have a ponytail eventually. I'll tell you. You look like Fabio. So, <laughs> yeah, more or less. But anyway, <laughs> not a bad guy to look so, like. So we, you know, we have to pray uh, for an end to this virus. That's for sure. But I also think we have to pray for peace and justice. And I use those two words together: peace and justice. Justice, no question. Justice. George Floyd and all the people who have given up their lives because of who they are, because of their color. So I think we want to pray for justice. And then, of course, pray for peace. I think that's an important thing. Peace starts in our hearts. You can't start outside. It has to be within you first. And then it goes out to the others. It goes out to the family. It goes out to the neighbors. It goes out to the world. Heavenly Father, we ask that you grant us all these petitions through Christ our Lord. Amen. This is Father Joe Grimaldi, and I look forward to seeing you next time on the Father Joe Podcast. We'd like to remind you to share the Father Joe Podcast with your friends. You can reach Father Joe at F-R-J-O-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. And you can find us on Facebook or say, Alexa, play the Father Joe Podcast. We look forward to seeing you next time.